So, uh, good morning everyone and welcome back to this course. So, uh, yesterday we had uh, covered query processing and we uh, ran out of time at the end and I am sure many of you had questions about query processing. So, let us start off today by taking a few questions on query processing after which we will move on to query optimization. So, I will set aside about 5 minutes now for any questions. If you have questions at this point, please indicate it on a view or send it by chat. So, let us start by seeing if anybody out there has a question. I see that Warangal has a question. Warangal, you are on now. Please go ahead. Uh, my question is related to the previous uh, slide. Uh, I mean in chapter 12 in the query processing, a quiz was given uh, in which a random IO was involved in both flash disk and hard disk. And we were asked to uh, just uh, find out which of the following uh, uh, query pro processing methodology will be working fine. Could you please explain that, sir, okay. again? So, the question was, um, we had uh, four different join algorithms, uh, nested loop, uh, index nested loop, sort merge and hash join. And the question was, supposing you switched from a magnetic disk to a flash uh, or a solid state disk, which of those four algorithms will benefit the most? That is, we will see the maximum increase in speed. Um, that is not to say it will be the most efficient always, but which will benefit the most? And the answer uh, logic is as follows. First of all, as we uh, discussed, uh, hard disks have a mechanical uh, device where an uh, arm moves to a position on the disk the disk spins and eventually to read a particular piece of information from the disk takes of the order of 10 milliseconds. In contrast, flash disk can read it within a microsecond or so. So, this is the basic difference between flash and hard disk. That is random access. If I say go to some random place and read one block, it is much faster on flash. If I say go to some random place and read uh, you know 5 megabytes then the difference between flash and hard disk is not as great. So, when I say go somewhere and read 5 megabytes, that is sequential access. And the question is, which of these algorithms benefits? And to answer that, you have to understand which of those algorithms has the maximum amount of random IO, because that is the one which will have a most reduction in cost. As we discussed, uh, nested loops join has two loops. One loop goes over the outer relation, one loop goes over the inner relation repeatedly. So, now, if you see the access to that relation is sequential. Occasionally, you go back to the beginning of the relation and then come down again in the inner loop. But most of the I O is sequential. So, nested loop will not benefit as much. It will benefit somewhat, but not that much. Similarly, merge join, the actual merge phase is entirely sequential. It is not going to benefit. The sorting phase has some amount of seeks. It will have some benefit, but Again, the sorting is also predominantly sequential. So, its benefit will also be limited. Similarly, hash join, the phase where uh, you read the original relations and partition them, the input is basically sequential. The output is not fully sequential, but it is not fully random either. You are going to write out uh, pieces of the partitions in fairly large blocks, multi megabyte blocks typically. So, the number of seeks required for a hash join is again not that high. Whereas, for an index nested loops join, every index lookup has at least one seek, assuming the inner relation is big. If the inner relation is in memory, it would not benefit at all. But if the inner relation is too big to fit in memory, then it is going to have uh, at least one and usually several IOs. Each For each outer tuple, you look up the index, fetch the tuple. So, that is multiple uh, IOs operations or multiple seeks are involved. So, now, if you have so many seeks, if you have 1000 tuples outside and even 2 or 3 seeks, it is like 2000 seeks for a fairly small result and can be much larger. Uh, and in that case, you are going to see a very big benefit. Okay, I hope that answered your question. Let us see if anybody else has a question. PSG Coimbatore has their question flag up. Let us see if you are on. PSG, you are on. Please go ahead and ask uh, whatever you wanted to ask. Hello, can you hear me, sir? Yes, we can. Please go ahead. 
uh, yeah, there are situations uh, the main table has only one primary key that has null values and uh, what is that situation the table accept null values sir okay so first of all if uh, something has to is declared as a primary key you cannot store a null value in sql that's a constraint which all database systems enforce uh, currently there were earlier versions of sql which allowed null values in a primary key uh, column but uh, the current standard since at least 92 if not earlier uh, disallows null value so you cannot do that now the question i interpreted as there is a situation where most records have an identifier which you want to use as the primary key but there are a few records for which you do not have that identifier but you still want to record that information in the database uh, one way to do that is to simply declare it as a unique key not as a primary key if you declare it as a unique key, it will make sure that two records cannot have the same value unless they are null. And depending on the implementation, I believe uh, unique allows multiple records with null, but I have to cross check this. Um, so, uh, you could try using the unique key if you need it in this particular situation. Uh, let us uh, go back to you to see if. Uh, that was the correct interpretation of your question or you have uh, something more to say. Back to you. Thank you, sir. Okay. Thank you, PSG. Okay. SGS, ITS, Indoor, you are on now. Indoor, please go ahead uh, with your question. Sir, I have a practical question. If uh, we are working in a proxy server, then there are many rules. Sometimes uh, there are 10,000 or more than 10,000 rules. And uh, the fields uh, like uh, priority, like uh, source address, destination address, and uh, many more fields there. Then how we perform indexing on the, these rules? Uh, if we tried according to priority, arrange the rules according to priority, then these are simple top to down approach. Then which rules should appropriate for indexing? So let me uh, first elaborate on that question. Uh, the question is, um, in a proxy server, uh, there are often many rules on what can be allowed, what should be blocked, um, who is allowed to access what. Those are the kinds of rules you are talking about, right? Uh, uh, please confirm that that is what you are talking about. Uh, back to you briefly to confirm that my interpretation is correct. And uh, the goal is to index these rules, right? Okay. So, the question is, uh, if you have rules like this with uh, basically uh, pattern matching rules and any request that comes through, uh, you have to index into these rules to see which rules apply to it. And amongst those rules which apply, uh, you may have uh, multiple uh, things and then there is a priority mechanism to say usually the first of those rules which apply will override the remaining ones. So, the question is, um, you have rules which involve many fields and then you have a request coming in which has several attributes and you have to index to see which of these rules apply. That is actually a very interesting question. So, normally when uh, we store relational uh, data in a database, the number of fields is fixed. Indices are on fixed fields. So, what we do is given a value or a range of values for a particular uh, attribute or for a list of attributes. The index lets us retrieve all the tuples uh, satisfying uh, that equality or that range. The question here is actually inverted. So, you can think of it the other way. You can think of these rules as kind of queries. They have a predicate. The predicate says if a equal to 5 or b equal to 10, then do something. Well, more realistically in this proxy example, it says if site equal to star dot x x x. Um, that is the pornographic uh, domain, uh, then block, do not allow it. If site equal to some other such site, block it. Now, there is one uh, country in the world which has a huge number of such rules. Uh, guess which one? Our neighbor, China. They put a lot of restrictions on what uh, sites people from inside China can view going out. So, this technology I am sure has been developed uh, vastly in China because they actually blocked outgoing requests for the entire country. They have a bunch of uh, servers apparently, 
which take, uh, you know, we, we usually think of proxy as within the institute. And uh, each institute here is a tiny fraction of the country. These guys uh, have the same kind of restriction going on for how, I don't know how many terabits of uh, pipeline that they have throughout the nation going out. So, the question is how can you efficiently implement these rules? Um, so, the first thing is uh, it is an indexing problem, but it is usually not an external memory indexing problem. Like B trees are designed for uh, hard disks or flash. Now, if you had to go to hard disk, uh, checking one request is going to take at least 10 milliseconds for one random I O, that is way too slow. So, all of these are in memory indexing. So, the next question is how do you index predicates? And this problem incidentally has been studied not only uh, by Chinese government security agencies, but also by many other people and in a different context. The context in which it has primarily been studied in the database area is uh, if you have people subscribing to something. So, uh, they can give a bunch of keywords and uh, you can do this with uh, Google for example. You can register a query with Google, say that I am interested in results for this set of keywords and whenever the result changes, something significant comes up, uh, Google will send you an email saying that here are some new results for your query, which is actually quite nice to track what is going on. Uh, one of the uses for uh, this kind of tracking are people who own copyright in something like music or books or so on, um, who would set up a Google uh, query which says uh, free download of uh, XYZ. And any time Google finds a new site with free download of XYZ, it is going to uh, send you an email saying here are these new sites which offer free download of XYZ. Uh, you can uh, guess why I know about this. Uh, you can substitute uh, some uh, three words for XYZ uh, which are very close to home. Um, so, uh, in fact, uh, we found a few uh, so, uh, sites which were offering free downloads of uh, some earlier editions of a book and uh, of course, that was completely illegal. So, uh, the question is given a large number of such requests which people have registered with a company like Google, how does Google efficiently find out which of these requests uh, are satisfied by a set of new pages? They have a set of new sites which they have found and they need to match it with the queries that people have registered. So, this is a reverse indexing. The query is indexed, the data is used to look up the query to see which queries match the data which is coming in. And I can't go into all the techniques. Uh, it's not that hard for keyword queries actually. Uh, you can easily reverse the role of data and query in a keyword search engine like Google, but it's a little bit harder for uh, database queries. Even in the database context, people have uh, done a lot of work on published subscribe systems. What are these publish subscribe? You can publish data on in a database and you can have people subscribing to data. Now, Google queries are similar to publish subscribe, but here the publish subscribe is more specific. Your uh, subscription could say give me all updates on relation x or it can say give me all relation on uh, uh, updates on relation x where the uh, city equals Mumbai or the institute equal to IIT Bombay or department equal to CS or whatever. So, you have conditions, uh, conditional subscription which subscribes to just those updates. So, now you have the same indexing problem where an update comes in, you need to know which all subscriptions are affected by the update. So, uh, how do you do this? Um, if there are, uh, uh, you know, fixed number of attributes for any relation, which is usually the case. So, the issue is uh, here you have a bunch of queries which look up different attributes. So, for each query uh, there are multiple attributes which it may refer to. So, whenever an update comes which affects where it an insert or, or, or in general an update or a delete satisfies that attribute, that query is a candidate. Now, there are uh, all kinds of interesting issues here. Uh, there may be certain attributes which where the query, you know, basically every data that comes in satisfies the query, but there may be some other attribute uh, where uh, the updates uh, which satisfy the query are relatively rare. And this in fact can be turned into its head which says given the query, what is the best index to use for it? And the best index will be the one which 
returns the fewest uh, tuples for it, if you have a query which says this and this. Now, inverting the problem, we select the best index for the query, but what we are doing with that index is not indexing the data, but we are indexing the query, which says if you have an AND condition, this and this, the query is indexed on one of those things, uh, and whenever that is satisfied by any new thing which comes in or anything which changes at all, you can check that query, set, check its other conditions and then see if it has a result. So, there is a lot of uh, interesting issues here. Um, if you send me email uh, later uh, or through Moodle, uh, send me a note, I will uh, send you pointers to uh, some work on indexing uh, queries like this. In fact, uh, one of the um, well known papers in this area uh, came from a person from Oracle, uh, who also uh, spent a fair amount of time uh, at Amrita uh, in uh, Kollam, I think, a few, about five, six years ago, a person called Jagannathan Srinivasan. Then there are other papers, of course, in this area. I will be happy to send you pointers. Uh, so, uh, that was for the database area. Coming to a proxy server, now there is no uh, question of uh, disk based indexing and such like, everything is on the fly. Uh, so, the specific set of techniques uh, is usually not driven by database issues, but by data structure issues, although they are very similar. Uh, the problems are similar, uh, but the solutions will look a little bit different because uh, everything is in memory, everything has to run super fast in uh, microseconds at most. So, there is a lot of uh, data structure hacking and so on including uh, hacking at the firmware level and other levels uh, on routers. So, the same kind of thing which you are talking about for proxies also happens on internet routers. There is a lot of rules in routers which have to be matched very fast. So, um, they have specialized hardware uh, and Cisco for example, is well known for this. Uh, they have highly parallel specialized hardware to do this kind of matching on the fly. So, I hope that answers your question. If anybody else has a question, we can take that. Otherwise, uh, let us switch over to today's topics. Okay, good. Looks like uh, there are no further questions.